So I want to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, Mark Roberts is back. He was here in the spring uh, of last year. And so we welcome him back. Mark is from the uh, Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. And so he's, uh, he brings a wealth of experience uh, with him. Uh, and you're also Harvard trained, I believe. Uh -huh. So lots of, lots of experience, has written on a number of different topics, has pastored, and is now providing leadership to that leadership center. And so Mark, I want to invite you to come on up and share with us. Let's welcome Mark. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, I spent uh, eight years in the Boston area, love New England, great to be back. Although I got to say, that was one heck of a storm. So I was actually... Um, speaking at a conference down in New York last weekend, and then I would be here this weekend. So rather than going back to California and then back here, I, um, I, I went up to the Boston area. My son is, is doing a PhD at Harvard. So I stayed with him during the week, and I studied in the library. And as this big storm was coming, and they're talking about how they're shutting the airports and everything, I'm, I'm feeling like really good about myself that that I have made this plan and it's going to be great because you know I'm just going to I'm just going to take the train down, and uh, so yesterday I'm watching I'm watching in the morning like what's happening with the trains and they're still running and they're still saying mine's running and the time you know on the the Amtrak site is they haven't changed it, but I thought you know I need better information. So for, again, this is sort of Jimmy's comment. There's this thing called Twitter, and if you don't know what that is, write Jimmy a letter and he'll tell you about it. So I go over to the Amtrak Twitter feed, which actually had the updated information way better than the official website. And I see, note, uh, we've closed everything between uh, Penn Station and Boston. And I'm thinking, okay, that's really bad. but. <laughs> But it's, it's temporary, suspended. They didn't say cancel, it's suspended. But I'm thinking, okay, this is not looking good because I'm in Boston and it's a long way down here if the train isn't running. So I thought, you know, maybe I can rent a car. And I, and I better do it soon because all the other people who are going to miss the train are going to want to rent the car. So I got on, turns out budget allows you to actually rent a car without a drop fee. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So sure enough, I head over to Logan Airport, get in the car, tell John he doesn't have to pick me up at the train station, I'll just drive down. And, and I did, and it was actually a fairly uneventful drive, given, you know, what it could have been. So I'm just really glad to be here, rather than sitting in South Station or, or calling John in the middle of the night saying, okay, you, you, you got to come get me. So anyway, uh, so all of my um, pride yesterday morning at all my great planning turned out not to have been very wise, but I'm really glad to be here. And glad to be back with you. I did. I had a great time with you uh, preaching last year at the end of April. Uh, enjoyed um, this congregation. I've known many of your folk over the years. Um, Sam and I are friends. I've known him. John and I have been friends for a whole lot of years, and I got to meet many of you last year. So thank you for having me back. All right. So let me get my various technology here to work. There's that. This is actually my timer. This is something, this is an important thing for speakers to have, right? Don't we agree with that? Yes. Um, actually, the worst thing you can ever have in your sanctuary, apart from having no clock, is to have a late clock, right? That's really bad. I've preached in places where I'm thinking, that clock is five minutes late. That's really not a smart idea. So. Uh, but we'll be on, on time here. So let me uh, offer a word of prayer, and then we will jump in, and I'll talk about what we're going to do in our time today. Uh, gracious God, how good it is to be here. We thank you for this day and the, actually the beauty and the freshness of the day. Uh, we thank you for the chance to gather, uh, for the chance to dig into your word. I'm grateful for these folks and for this church for their faithfulness and their witness, and for obviously their desire to go deeper in their uh, knowledge of your word and what it means to live as people that have been called to you. And so we pray that you will um, guide and teach and speak and use this time well for your purposes, for this congregation and for each, each life here. Uh, Lord, we want to lift up in prayer today 
Uh, some of those whose um, homes have been flooded or have had other kinds of things owing to the storm, we ask for your grace for them and for things to be uh, repaired quickly. Uh, again, we're thankful for your presence with us in Christ's name. Amen. So I want to explain what we're going to do here. Uh, if you've seen any of the promotional information for this event, we're going to do what was promised. Uh, we're, we're focusing in on vocation or calling, and we'll talk about that and what that means and why, why that's important. And we're going to do it uh, in part by really focusing on Ephesians. Now, as you might have heard, or you know, I actually have a fairly recent commentary out on Ephesians. And so one reason I speak on Ephesians is because that's actually something I, I know something about and, and have something to offer. But uh, I, I'll explain why I wrote a commentary on Ephesians in particular, and that will help to explain why I'm excited about what we are going to do here. So now it's probably six years or so ago, I was uh, speaking at a conference, and one of the other speakers, who's a prominent New Testament scholar, came up to me and said, you know, we're doing this commentary series with Zondervan, the publisher, and uh, I, I'm... I want to know if you would be interested in contributing to it. And I was complimented by that. A scholar, a person, Scott McKnight, some of you might know his name, somebody I, I, I respect and thought, well, well, tell me more about the series. So he explained what they were doing and I was interested in, in the idea and I said, you know, I would really be interested. But honestly, I, I would only want to do Ephesians. And he said, well, we haven't promised it yet, so I'll take that into consideration. And if we can give you Ephesians, then I'll we'll let you know. So good. So it went away for a while, and then later came back, and they gave me Ephesians. Uh, Scott, of course, was interested. Well, why, why Ephesians? You know, there are other good books in the New Testament. You know, why not any of the others? <laughs> and, uh, and so I explained to him there are a couple reasons. So one is, and this is just kind of a personal life thing. Um, I'd been pastor of a church in Irvine, California for 16 years, a preaching pastor. And I always wanted to preach on Ephesians. But honestly, I never felt like I was quite ready. I never felt like I was quite ready theologically or in terms of wisdom and uh, to, to actually tackle that letter. It's not an easy letter. And so it had been sort of on my my bucket list as a pastor, someday I'm going to preach on Ephesians. And in fact, the, uh, I was planning to preach on Ephesians in the year that turned out to be the first year I had been away from that church. So there was kind of this unfulfilled personal goal. You know, it was my bucket list thing, I got to preach on Ephesians. We, but you say, well, so why Ephesians? Uh, the biggest reason for me was that more than any other book of the Bible, Ephesians lays out for us God's vision for the church. Now, there are other passages in Scripture that speak to who we are as the church. But there is literally no other book in the whole Bible that more succinctly and expansively says, this is what the church is supposed to be. This is the role of the church in God's grand plan for all that God is doing. This is who we are as the church. And the reason I wanted to preach on Ephesians so as to preach on the church is, I'm sure this is not a secret to any of us, we're in a time of extraordinary challenge for and transitions in church. Uh, the, the, the kind of church experience that many of us had growing up is disappearing. Now, I grew up in the First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood, which in its day was actually the largest Protestant church in America, had 9,000 members in the 50s, uh, and was just a, a very major and influential and thriving uh, Presbyterian church in our denomination. And I had a, a great experience growing up in that church. Um, that church is still thriving, but they're probably now, I don't know, a thousand members. Maybe worship attendance is about maybe a, a tenth of what it was. Um, 
And it, it's, a, it's still a wonderful church, but such different dynamics, such different challenges. Uh, uh, it's just, it's a new world and a new day. Uh, many, many, many of the traditional churches are out and out failing. In fact, increasingly, I'm sure it happens probably in New England. I haven't tried it, but as you, as you go around, you'll see church buildings that have become something else now, right? They're like stores or restaurants or, you know, in some parts of the country, mosques. You think, huh, well, that says something about what's going on in the, in the church today. Uh, in more positive ways, there are churches being planted all over the place. Now, I don't, I don't know if you have any church plant. You do, right? In fact, John and I were talking last night. There's a fairly new church plant in town. Uh, all over, new churches are being planted with new forms and new ideas and new ways of defining church and new ways of leading. And uh, that raises all kinds of issues and questions. And what does it mean to be the church today? And I think it's, uh, it's both scary and sometimes frustrating, but also challenging and exciting to be in this time when the whole question of what does it mean to be God's church, what does it mean to be the people of God together, is a question that we're working on. But one of the concerns I have had is that it sometimes seems that that conversation is not adequately informed by Scripture. That, that we, we, if we um, are going to do something new as a church, or if we're going to start a new church, we just kind of do the latest cool thing. We see what's working, and we do that. We try something because it's innovative and new, or hip, or whatever it is, and we get excited about those things. And some of them, as I watch them, seem to me to be uh, inadequately grounded on a biblical understanding of what the church really ought to be that there's a, a deficit of that kind of theological understanding. Uh, the same would be true, though, for many of us who've been in more established churches. When was this church established? 1863. So you've been around for a while. It's been around for a while. Civil War. Wow, that would be, well, we won't go off on that tangent, but it's an interesting time to have planted a church. But so. Churches that are more established, again, a lot of times we get established in ways that feel very comfortable to us, familiar, maybe even have been fruitful, but they may not really be an adequate reflection of what it is that God wants the church to be. And so that was my initial uh, draw to Ephesians. That's part of why I'm excited about it, and, in, and I think it's important. But what I've also come to know a, a, after studying this letter is that it not only speaks to the church as the community together, but out of that it speaks also to our individual lives and it says some things that are extraordinarily important to us individually and sometimes things that we don't attend to or understand very well as Christians. And so I've come to see that Ephesians, in one sense you could say it sort of fills in the gaps of our, of our understanding of what it is to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it, another way to think of it is it, it's not that it fills in the gaps as it, as it kind of expands the horizon for us. It expands our vision of what God intends for us in our individual Christian life as well as in our life together. And believe it or not, after five plus years of just studying Ephesians to death and living with it and, and struggling with it and wrestling with it and then writing on it, I, I'm, I, I, mean, I think, truly more excited about this letter and its truth today than I was when I started. It's not one of those projects where you're done and you're like, thank God, I'm never going to think about that again, right? Some of you, know, I'm sure, have had that experience in life. Uh, you know, this is more like, it's more like raising children where it's different now and that's good, but you're still pretty deeply invested and interested and excited about uh, what's come out. And that's good news for Jimmy because uh, he's just getting going here. <laughs> My children are 25 and 23, and it's just an amazing thing to be with them in this season of life. I'm really okay that they're not newborns. Uh, 
so similarly with Ephesians, you've sort of, I've been the one growing up, and it's not that Ephesians has grown, but as I've grown up with this letter, I, I am as excited about it, and I'm really excited to be able to share some things with you. We're going to start, the basic game plan is we're going to start actually in the middle of the letter here, and then we're going to go back and sort of do some backfill so that we can get the sense of what's going on in the middle. And then this evening, we'll kind of do the latter part of the letter. Uh, and my hope is it'll, it'll, this will be a standalone thing. If all you do is you hear these lectures, you'll say, yeah, I, I, I get this letter. I understand more clearly than before who we are as God's church, who we are as God's people, whom I to be, whom I am as a person called by God. Uh, if you want more, you can have the commentary. You got it for free. Uh, you can get it on Amazon and, you know, I'm not here to sell books, but if you say, boy, I, that, I got a lot of questions. Um, I, I actually have answers <laughs> for a lot of those things, which is one of the challenges of writing a commentary. I really didn't, I'd written one before, but I'd been a long time. So when you're a preacher or a teacher, and many of you know this, and you're, you're working through a text and there's a, a really tricky verse, like you don't know what it means. There's a way to kind of get around that, right? I mean, one thing is you just don't mention it in the sermon. <laughs> or another is you can say something about it that's true, but you don't really have to figure it out. And it's not really cheating. It's just, you know, that's just the way it is. Except when you're writing a commentary, all of a sudden you don't have that option anymore. You can't say, well, gee, I, I really don't know what it means that it says of Jesus that he's the fullness of the one who fills all things with himself. I, I, that's the end of chapter one. I'm like, I have no idea what that means, but that will not be adequate in the commentary. I'm sorry, verse 19, no idea. <laughs> Go on. And uh, that was really, I mean, I'm serious about this. It was, it was an act of, of serious faith and wrestling with God often to say, Lord, what is, what is going on here? So um, that was, uh, so we're, if, so if you want more, I, I've got some more. But what we're going to do is focus, I think, on some of the high points. And the, this morning's more oriented toward the theology and then this evening's lecture more oriented toward how we live out that theology in the context of the community and our family and our church and our workplace. So I want to begin by reading uh, the first six verses of chapter four. And I, I think I'm reading out of the NIV uh, in case you wonder what translation. Uh, so listen to God's word now, Ephesians 4, one to six. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Our big focus at first is going to be on this uh, first verse. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, this is really the center point, if you will, of Ephesians. This is kind of everything before leads up to this, everything beyond leads from this. This is another way of thinking, sort of the hinge in that the first chapters of Ephesians are very theological and then it pivots and the last four, although theologically informed, are more practical. Uh, it starts out, I a prisoner for the Lord. Uh, Paul, most scholars believe, is literally a prisoner at this time, but is understanding that his imprisonment has um, God's purposes in it. I should mention, in case you have run in at some point in your life to these, uh, the thesis that, that Paul actually didn't write Ephesians. There are some who say, for reasons of difference in language and theology, this was probably written by a, a close follower of Paul, uh, you might say in his honor, that writing in his name wasn't meant to be deceptive, but was 
a, a, a way of communicating that was common in that day. Um, and again, in the, the commentary, I'll talk about that. I, I, don't, I don't see any reason for that um, conclusion, except that we need to acknowledge that in some ways, Ephesians is different from some of the other things that Paul has written. It, 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 for the, one of the clearest is, you know, in Romans and Galatians, Paul talks a lot about justification by faith. That's not in here, which worries people some. Uh, Paul talks in here more about salvation. Now, those concepts are, are not the same, but they are certainly complementary. And I think what we have here is some newer reflections by Paul, uh, newer theological insights, like most people. You know, he was growing in his understanding and experience, and I think that's reflected in this letter. The, um, the command of this verse, the imperative is, is to, uh, as the translation says, to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Live a life actually translates the Greek word uh, to walk. And that, that's a word that we're even somewhat familiar with. People sometimes talk about your Christian walk or how are you walking in Christ. And that reflects really an Old Testament metaphor a Hebrew metaphor for walking has to do with how we live. It has to do with the, the moral and ethical dimensions of our life. So we walk in a certain way means we are living intentionally and choicefully in a certain way. So this is saying walk, live, walk, worthy of the calling you've received. Now we get to this word calling. The uh, the Greek language can refer to a literal verbal summons. Somebody yells at you and calls you over, that's a calling. But of course, it's used in a different sense here. And in scripture, it, it refers um, to a, a calling that isn't literal, but is in some other sense real and yet not that. Well, what is it? Uh, the language of calling is strongly informed by the Old Testament stories of God's calling certain people into certain kind of work. So you think back to Moses at the burning bush, right? God literally speaks to Moses, literally calls him, you know, back to Egypt to uh, deliver the Israelites. You think of some of the, the prophetic books in which God literally speaks to Isaiah and calls him into prophetic work. This language here is informed by that, the notion that God um, speaks to us and calls us, perhaps sometimes literally, but if not literally in an audible way, nevertheless, we have a calling. We have been summoned by God into something, and we're to live our life worthy of that. Now, Absolutely crucial points here as we think about calling. By the way, I should, I should probably say that the word calling and the word vocation are essentially the same word. The word calling comes from, it's sort of the English ends up Old Norse or something, um, but calling, vocation comes from the Latin, vocare, if you took Latin, it's, um, or vocatio, it's a, um, uh, Again, it's literally a, a yelling at someone, a summons, and then it can have other kinds of meaning. So when we're talking about calling in the Christian context, we're talking about vocation in the Christian context, I mean, that's the same thing. It's just a different word for the same thing. Sometimes you'll hear people even use the phrase vocational calling, which I always find kind of interesting because that's really just this, like calling, calling. But <laughs> it's all right. So... What's so important as we read Ephesians, so it says to live a life worthy of the calling you have, been rece uh, you have received. Uh, this letter is being addressed to just a whole lot of ordinary Christians, if you will. Saints, according to the way Paul would talk about us. But this isn't just to the leaders or to some special people. This is to a broad spectrum of Christian folk. What does that mean? The number one point to get here is that every Christian has a calling. Every one of us has a calling. Now, 
that's different from the way that language functioned in my life as I was growing up in a Presbyterian church. Because in the church I grew up with, calling meant you had a calling to be a pastor or a missionary. And so in fact, when I began to think maybe I would be a Presbyterian pastor, I would go to what was called back then the, the candidates committee. And the big question they had for me was, do you have a call? That's how they'd say it. But do you have a call? And what that meant was a special call to pastoral ministry. If when they, I had had my first meeting with that committee, they said, do you have a call or a calling? And, I, and if I had said, well, of course I do because I'm a Christian, that would have been like cheeky and inappropriate and they wouldn't have liked that answer. Because calling was something for the special people and everybody else didn't really have one in the way we used that language then. Uh, certainly, certainly God sometimes calls people to particular kinds of work, pastor work, missionary work. Of course, I would add attorney work, teacher work, doctor work, carpenter work. Uh, we'll get into that later. But there can be particular callings. What's being referred to here is something that all Christians share in, both individually and together. And so the important piece is that you have a calling. Now, there's a, an implication of that, which is really important when we talk about calling or vocation. And so number two, you have a caller. You have a calling in the sense that someone is calling you. You say, well, why is that important? Because in the secularized use of this language sometimes as people talk about calling or they talk about vocation, uh, a lot of times what that is referring to is this, this inner sense of something I need to do. And so a person could say, well, I, I, I really have a calling to be a teacher. And that person may not have any faith in God at all. So it, it, it's not about an outside actual caller, it's an inner conviction. That's a fine thing, a good thing to have that inner conviction, but that's not the biblical thing. Calling, biblically speaking, is coming from the caller, and that says to us that there's, there's an authoritative voice out there that is um, asking us, calling us to do something. So calling isn't simply a matter of figuring out your own feelings or doing what you want to do or even feel passionate about. It's about responding to something external to you that then you internalize and you make your way of living. So I think, for example, when I was growing up and uh, I, uh, my dad would always be the one who would get me up in the morning to go to school. He was my human alarm clock. And, uh, I, I would sleep upstairs, my dad would be downstairs, and around whatever time, 6.45, he'd call, literally, Mark, are you up? And of course, my answer would be yes. And so then he'd leave me alone, I'd go back to sleep for a while. <laughs> and then uh, a few minutes later, Mark, are you up? Yes, you need to get up, okay. And generally, I'd try for a little longer. And then, the next time around, I would hear his feet coming up the stairs. <laughs> and I would jump out of bed and you know, put on a shirt and look like I'd been up for a while. The point of that calling, I was, there was a calling coming to me. And it was expecting um, action. It was a calling external to me. So there was an authority there, namely my dad, who had uh, authority over my life who was calling me to do something and I needed to live it out. And that's really the third. So the second point is you have a caller and the third point is it's a calling to be lived. Your vocation, God's call on your life, isn't something just to be embraced or enjoyed or it's certainly not a, a, a matter of pride. Well, I have a calling. It is something that you need to live into. But that of course raises the big question. It, which is, so what is the, the nature of the calling? What's being said, if you will, 
What is it that God is saying to each and all of us? So what is the calling we have that we're needing to live into and live out? Um, why don't you find it interesting the way language shifts? So we would used to say you would live out your calling. That's what I'd say. Now the language has substantially shifted. People talk about living into things. Well, that's, that's okay. The thing I find kind of funny is also, like if I say to my son, hey, do you want to, uh, do you want to have dinner when I'm visiting him? He'll say, yeah, I'm down. <laughs> uh, see, I would have said, well, I'm up for that. <laughs> He's down. He's not depressed or discouraged. That just means I want to go. It's, that's not really a point of anything other than recognize, I was just talking about living out or living in, whichever one works for you. It's to be lived, it's to be embodied, it's to be engaged, your calling. And this is what we've got to figure out. What is the calling? Now, if you do good Bible study, you say, well, one of the ways we can answer that question is we look elsewhere in Ephesians to see if there's this language of calling or vocation shows up elsewhere, and does it show us what this calling is? And there are a couple of places where the language of calling is used, and it gives us a little bit of a hint. Uh, verse 118 of the Ephesians speaks of the hope to which he has called you. So there's some sense of the future, uh, something about what God is doing there, and we're being called to that. Also, verse 4, 4 speaks and says, you were called to one hope. So we got hope again. So there's something in the future in this calling, but it still doesn't give us too much more. You say, you want to say, well, Paul, you say we're to live life worthy of the calling with which you've been called, but what is it? And what seems to me to be true is that Paul is using this language of calling in a sense to summarize everything that has gone earlier in Ephesians in the first three chapters. In other words, the calling with which you've been called emerges from those chapters. It emerges from the story of what God has done and is doing and will do, future hope in Christ. Ephesians 1 to 3 essentially lays out this story of, of the gospel, a wide story of the gospel, God's work among us. And then it says, in light of this story, there's an implied calling. That is to say, you can't read this, you can't believe it without needing to live in a transformed way because of what God has done, is doing, and will do in Jesus Christ. And so I'd suggest to you that the calling emerges from those first three chapters in Ephesians. And if that's true, then in order to really answer the question of how we live our calling, we've got to pay some attention to the first three chapters of Ephesians. And so what I want to do in a very short amount of time here today is kind of give you the overview of those chapters so you can get the main theme of the story and then begin to see what it would be for us to live out our calling. The, uh, the first chapters of Ephesians are exceptional in many ways. For one thing, they tell the story of God's great work in Christ in a, in a succinct and a profound way that literally is unique in all of Scripture. But the particular language of the first chapters of Ephesians is also very challenging and inspiring language. I mean, among other things, Ephesians 1 has the two longest sentences in the whole Greek New Testament. Uh, what come to us in translation, many sentences. So for example, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 has 202 words in Greek, the longest sentence. Ephesians 15 to 23 is the second longest sentence, and it has 169 words. Now why is that important? It, it gives you a, a kind of a feel for the, the expansiveness and creativity, uh, sort of the, the poetic insight, as well as the theological depth of the stuff we're getting into. This is really uh, 
though consistent with other things Paul has written, this is, this is sort of big and grand and long and hard and complex and wonderful. And you can find that even in the length of the sentences. So I'm going to read a portion of that first sentence to you. I'm not going to talk about it all. But what I want you to do is just try to take it in and get a sense of the, the bigness and also what God is doing here. So I begin in Ephesians 3, excuse me, 1, 3, and I'll read through verse 10. That's not the whole sentence, but it's the good part of it. And again, grasp this, the bigness of this. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure, with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, I, I think you get the sense of this, even if, you know, you didn't pick up the individual words. I just how how much is going on here? This this just expansiveness of God's grace, the richness of God's grace that He's lavished on us, and God has has chosen us and blessed us and redeemed us and forgiven us, and there's all this good stuff that God has been doing through Christ, and all of that passage moves toward this last verse, this last proclamation. In this translation, it says that these things are to be put in effect when the times reach their fulfillment. The original language actually speaks of um, all of God's plan that is, is for the fullness of the times. God's plan for the ideal time. God's plan for the time when God has determined to sort of wrap up everything he is doing. God has a plan. And the plan is put very simply in the end of this passage. God's plan is this, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Uh, the verb translated to bring unity sometimes is, um, in secular language, it was about adding up a column, say a column of numbers. If any of you are accountants or do finance work and you add up the column, that would, you would use that Greek word. It's sort of taking all these different pieces and pulling them together. Uh, and literally, the, the plan that God has for the fullness of time is to, to bring to unity, to add up, to gather up, it says, all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth in him. Now, this is very interesting. I would imagine that if um, tomorrow you were to take a survey outside of church as people are coming, and you're going to say to folks, you know, what is God's big plan? The, what is God's biggest plan in, in, in terms of what God is doing in the world? I wouldn't be surprised if literally nobody said this. And it's not a criticism of your church. This is not the way we tend to think. Somebody, your neighbor would ask you, well, what's God doing in the world? We say, well, God is, God is in the process of, of gathering up and unifying all things in heaven and earth. We wouldn't say that. But that's what's here. That this is, is God's big plan. Now, some of us want to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I thought God's plan was like to get people saved. Well, it is. We'll see it in Ephesians 2. But being saved is a part of this larger thing that God is doing. Another question you'd say, well, why is that necessary? Why, why do we have to 
gather up all things in Christ? What, what's the need for it? It, it? The implication is somehow things are scattered out. And that's exactly the problem. So in order to understand what's going on in Ephesians, we have to remember what happens in Genesis. God creates heaven and earth. God creates human beings to take care of heaven and earth, to steward it well, to, to, allow, to help the, the world and the creation to be full as God intended it to be. Uh, but what happens? The man and the woman sin, and what happens when sin comes into the picture? It takes this uh, put-together world that God has created, and it breaks it apart. It splits it up. It shatters it. And from that point onward, things are not as God intended them to be. But the God who created the world good and very good, who delighted in his creation, isn't going to leave it there. Now, I realize that some of us grew up with a theology that says, well, what God's going to do is burn up the whole creation and save us all up into heaven, and that's God's plan. But if you really study carefully the scripture, you discover that's not quite the version of God's plan. Absolutely, we're going to be saved, but go to the end of Revelation. It's about a new heaven and a new earth, that God is in the business of taking all that is broken and mending it putting it back together, bringing it together in Christ. So that the end point of time isn't a bunch of disconnected individuals up in heaven with nothing to do except, you know, grab a harp and sit on a cloud and, and worship God. The vision of the future is somehow of God's recreating all things, putting it back together, heading up all things in Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth. So that all creation can, again, once again, be what God intended it to be. And be a pace of fruitfulness, and multiplication, and abundant life. And we're caught up in that story. What God is doing in Christ is something that is for us, but also, as we'll see, that includes us. And so we jump on to the second chapter of Ephesians. Now that chapter begins uh, with a very interesting use of language in that it talks about the fact that we who are apart from Christ are dead already. It, it, it takes time and it sort of turns it differently so that we're already dead in our trespasses and sins, it says. But God, who is rich in mercy, makes us alive in Christ. In fact, that passage talks about, in one sense, our already being raised with Christ. So again, we think of resurrection at the end of time, but it sort of moves it into the middle. And then we get to kind of the core thesis of that text, which is a verse which I, I imagine is most familiar to many of us. Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. This is one of those verses that uh, I expect you've heard taught and preached many times, and uh, for good reason. This is one of the core anchor verses of our faith. We have been saved by God's grace, so it's not something we've earned. It's not something we can work for. It is a gift of grace received in faith, and this is core, core to our understanding of who we are in Christ. Saved by God's grace and faith, the grace that is earlier described as lavish and rich and immeasurable has saved us from death into life. Thanks be to God. Now again, in much of my life as a Christian, that good news was preached in that way, or taught in that way, which was fine, but it didn't go on with even what this particular text says. So if you read Ephesians 2, 8, 
but you keep reading and you follow the flow of the argument, you get a, a, a fuller picture of what God is doing. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't that something? Saved by grace, not works. Really clear. You do not earn your salvation. I cannot tell you how many times in my pastoral life I'd meet with people in the church. Some of them have been around a long time. People who had accepted Jesus in their life. And I'd say to them, so tell me, you know, if, if you were to die today and go to heaven, you know, why do you get in? And they'd say, well, I've tried to live a good life. I'm like, have you, like, listened to anything? <laughs> I didn't say that. Because I, I think that's kind of, that's like where we start. And then I'd say, now, oh, come on. You can do it. Well, well, I believe in Jesus. I'm like, okay, good. That would be better. Uh, you know, even better to mention God's grace at that point and, and believe in Jesus. It, 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 there's this thing, even in, among people who know the gospel, that somehow a little bit of us thinks we got to earn it really. Uh-uh. It's by grace. Grace is unmerited. By definition, not earned. However, that's not the end of what God is doing in us through Christ. God raised us from death to life, not so we could just hang out. It says, for we are God's handiwork. The Greek there is actually the word poema. It's related to our word poem. It's not meant poem. It's that we're what God has done. So God has, the sense of God is a craftsman who has crafted us. God is a potter who has made us. And we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. So this is the new creation in Christ. Newly created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Not saved by works, but saved for good works. And in fact, those are prepared in advance. Uh, the NIV says prepared in advance for us to do. The Greek says prepared in advance for us to walk in them. This is part of the walking we are to do. So, so the good news of the gospel is that God has saved us from death into life, and in that life we actually have things to do that God has prepared for us to do that are good things that contribute to God's work in this world. And we get a little ahead of ourselves, but it, it, these aren't only the things we do, say, in church. It's not only ushering or singing in the choir or leading a youth group, although those are great and important things. I mean, the good works that God has prepared for us are not just the things that happen on this property. They're the things that happen when you go out into the world as God's people. Uh, and so it has to do with the things you do most of your life, every day, are potentially the good works that God has for you to do if you do them with his guidance and for his glory. We'll talk more about that especially tonight. There's the, um, so you might say if, if the great omission in uh, Ephesians 2 was that we are saved by grace through faith for good works, and the for good works is the first great omission. The second great omission in Ephesians 2 is the whole second half of the chapter. And I don't really have time to go into that in depth and read it, but if you do on your own, what you'll see is that the second half of Ephesians looks very much like the first, a parallel, very similar, and connected. And it's all part of one picture of what God has done in Christ. I'll read just one section so you'll get, get the point. It, it says, but now in Christ, you who are once far off, that is Gentiles, far off from Jews, who are the people of God. But now in Christ, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he's made 
both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, that's the hostility between us. He abolished the law with its commandments and ordinance that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross. Now, I know that's a lot. But what you need to hear is that last thing, through the cross. Somebody asks you, why did Jesus die on the cross? And you answer, he died to take the penalty for our sin on himself so we could be saved. Absolutely, thanks be to God, that's true. That's not the whole story. It is also true that through the cross, Christ died in order to reconcile uh, um, people who had been alienated from each other, who, who were in, in enmity together, to reconcile divided peoples through the cross. So, well, you're saying the cross is not only about personal salvation and forgiveness. Yes, it's not only about that. We'll say, well, why, how does that work? And once again, we go back to the fundamental problem. God created the world in a certain way. He created humankind with a certain mission, messed it up, the world split apart. What's the first thing in Genesis 3 that happens when sin enters the picture? The man and the woman hide from each other. There is a brokenness in human relationship. And that gets played out in history. So when God comes in Christ, to deal with the problem of sin, yes, it deals with individual sin. And thanks be to God, we can become uh, reconciled to God and forgiven. And we are his workmanship. And we are individually created for good works. Awesome. And the divisions between people are to be mended through the cross. That's part of why Christ died. That's part of the, if you will, the second great omission in Ephesians 2 that we don't as often hear that part of the gospel. There's much to be said about that, and we don't really have the time to do it. But as we think of what's going on in our church and our churches and in our world today, and the extraordinary need for reconciliation that is genuine, for reconciliation that includes justice, for reconciliation that is real, for rebuilding broken relationships. That's absolutely about what Jesus did and is doing. It's not like extra credit Christianity. It's core to the gospel. It's still part of the story. Now we're in Ephesians 3. I have 11 minutes before Jimmy brings out the big hook. No, then we'll have a little Q&A. Chapter 3 of Ephesians kind of does an interesting sort of twist for a little bit. And it's Paul talking about his own ministry and how God called him to basically bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But this is what he says, and this is just very interesting because it begins then to speak to us. He says, although I'm the very least of all the saints, that's because he once persecuted the church. This grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan. Remember we talked about God's plan for the fullness of time to gather all things together in Christ. And to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. See the mention of creation there? Now you see why the plan in creation, because if the plan is to pull things together, it's significant that God created all things. God created things to be together. They split up God's plan. God who created all things put them back together. Uh, the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Uh, the worldview here is one that envisions the whole cosmos, the whole universe, kind of filled with spiritual powers and realities. And it's kind of like all these powers and realities are gathered in, a, say, a, a giant stadium. 
and they're all watching. And what they're watching on the field is us, is the church. And it is through the church that the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, as well as you might say our earthly neighbors. Through the church. What is it that they're supposed to see in the church? They're supposed to see that what God has done in Christ has actually made a difference, not only in individual lives transformed, but in the church they're going to see that this brokenness of creation is now being mended in Christ as the church pulls together and is a demonstration of what the cross has accomplished, both in the redemption of individual lives and in the reconciliation of peoples together in unity. And so what all the powers are watching is the church unified in a way that is miraculous, that comes through the death of Christ and the powers and all the observers know that the gospel is true because they, they see it in our life together. Of course, at this point, it's very tempting to tell the other story, isn't it, of all the ways that the church has failed and how poorly sometimes we reflect the gospel to our neighbors. I think you could also tell the story, and I'm sure you could in this congregation, of the, the other way, when there have been times when you have lived together in such a way that People see Christ in you and are drawn to him through you. I'm sure that's happened in this church. Many, Probably some of you in this room could tell the story of your own life, of how you were drawn to Christ through the living witness of the people in this community. It just ought to be more and more and more of that story, and especially in today's world. You know, why, why in the world would someone who's an unbeliever out there give a rip about what we're doing in here, really? unless what they see and experience in your life together is such that they say there's something there that I need. There's something there that's amazing. I cannot believe how those, how those Christians over there are living together in a way that is filled with grace and mercy and justice and compassion. There must be something going on there. I don't even know what it is. That's Paul's vision for the church. Now, having said that, there's a part of us who said, that thinks, oh, that's like impossible, right? I mean, maybe you don't in this church, but in, at least in every church I've ever been a part of, including the one I pastored, uh, it, it, you think, oh, that feels just overwhelming. You maybe know the story. It's probably been told by pastors here before, but like they, um, they found a guy who'd been stranded on a desert island for 20 years. And uh, they noticed that he'd built three little huts. And so they asked him, what are the three huts? He said, well, that one's my house. Well, what's the, what's the second hut? Well, well, that's my church. And what's the other hut? That was the church I was in before I built the new church. <laughs> so that's us. But there is hope, and the hope is that we're not in this alone, that God's grace and power and love can be transforming and enable us to live it out. And, and so Paul, after giving his vision of the church, then prays for the church, he prays for us. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you're being rooted and grounded in love, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God.
In other words, there's no way we are going to be what God envisions us to be except for the fact that God will fill us with his spirit and his love such that we could be filled with all the fullness of God. And if that isn't enough, then Paul ends the first three chapters with this particular um, kind of thrilling doxology. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So if the work of reconciliation, if the work of living the gospel so that the world can see the, the, the reality of Christ in us feels overwhelming, we are reminded in this final uh, doxology it, that God, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. For his glory, for, for him be glory in the church as we live the gospel and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul says, and I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling with which you've been called. So in light of this thing that God has done and is doing, in light of this bringing of all things together, in light of the the moving us from, from death to life and, and recreating us in Christ for good works. And in light of the fact that through the cross we can be reconciled one to another, in light of the fact that God is calling the church to be the demonstration of the gospel to the world, and in light of the fact that, that God's love can fill us to all fullness and that God is able to do in us through the Spirit more than all we can ask or imagine, in light of all that, there's a calling in there to participate in this. So now... Live your life in light of that. Live that out together. And we're going to talk a lot tonight, especially about how we do that. But I want in the last minute and a half to note where it starts. Because you might think it would start in some grand vision of grand ministry. So go to all the world and preach the gospel and, you know, something big. In fact, it starts very small and personal and local. Lead a life worthy of a calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Where does all this start? It starts with how we live with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, where we not only confess that the cross leads to reconciliation, but we live out that reconciliation in very practical, everyday ways through humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love that, of course, assumes that we're going to need to be born with, right? That you've got to put up with people. Making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And that's where it begins. Small. Oh yeah, Jesus talked about mustard seed, kind of the same. Small, it's right here. Something we can even do right now. We can do today. We can begin to do this. You can do this right here. And so this grand, amazing vision of Ephesians as we're to live out that calling is something that we can do in our family, among our friends, the session meeting, the deacons meeting, your small group, your Sunday school class, your mission trip, et cetera, et cetera. Pastor nominating committee. And so we live it out in very tangible and real ways each day. So. I'm going to stop now, and we're going to go into a time of Q&A, and we've got about 15 minutes for that. Um, so anything you want to ask about?
And I have the Q&A microphone, so just raise your paw up with yeah. the microphone to you. Amy has the Q&A microphone. It's not actually a question if it doesn't come through the microphone. So what do you wonder about? What do you want to challenge? What is stirring? When you were talking about calling, the spiritual gifts were coming to my mind, and I wonder whether that's where you're going with that. Or can you shed some light on it? Well, you know, it's interesting. I will, oh, that's in the lead. So if, if you go to the leader's dinner, I'll talk about that a little bit. The way Paul talks about gifts in Ephesians. Will that be taped too? So people could watch it later? Do we know? Jimmy, do you know if that's? Uh, possibly. Okay, possibly. possibly. That's a sure. question mark next All to All right, that. put him on the spot. Uh, so the, 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 the way Paul talks about gifts in Ephesians is kind of different, but to use really more the, the way he talks about gifts in, in 1 Corinthians, the idea would be that as you are called to live your whole life for God and his purposes, that God then supplies through the Spirit all kinds of help. And there's sort of two main categories of help uh, laid out in the New Testament. The one would be what we call the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5. And that has to do more with character formation and, and the kind of inner formation that then leads into how we treat each other. And then there are the gifts of the Spirit, which are supernatural um, um, I I empowerments that God gives us to do the ministry to which God calls us. And so there's, um, th there are times when we are seeking to serve God, whether it's, again, in context of the church or the mission trip or with your neighbors or whatever, where you need something extra and God supplies something extra. Um, I, have a, I had an example. Dang, it happened to me recently and I'm now forgetting. It'll come back to me in a minute or God will give it to me in a minute, which would be a spiritual gift. Um, but there was a, oh, what was this? Nuts, I can't think of it. Um, the point is though, yes, God helps us. And, and if you wanna say specifically, how does that happen? So some of that is just the inner transformation and the character that comes through the work of the spirit. Um, some of that is very uh, distinct additional empowerment for certain kind of work that we would do. And that's a lot of how God helps us to live out the calling. So yes, those are closely connected. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So we'll talk about this a little bit. So then what is the relationship between the calling that we all share, this calling, and what we would talk about in terms of our particular callings, vocations, professions, how does that relate? And there's a big story there, but the, the simple thing is all Christians are called to live our lives in light of this gospel, to be transformed people, to participate in God's work in the world. Where we do that and how we do that is going to be very different depending on a lot of factors, depending on our skills and talents our giftedness, our life situations, even particular passions, or sometimes very particular direct guidance that God gives to us in speaking to us about certain things. So um, we will use in sort of a secular sense, we'll talk about your calling as sort of the career about which you were particularly committed, which is an okay way to talk there for Christians, we would say, my fundamental calling is to live my whole life for God, and that's going to take the form of being a doctor or a banker or a mother or a you know, daycare worker or whatever. That's going to take, or a pastor, that's going to take this form. And, and we'll talk about that as calling. The only danger there is if we only think of that not the calling that we all share, then, then we've lost this huge thing. Which again, in the Presbyterian tradition, we've tended historically to talk about calling, mainly in terms of pastoral calling or missionary calling, which forgets the calling we all share and also implicitly devalues many other kinds of work 
that actually is also an expression of calling. Yeah, yes. Two thousand years ago, it was uh, paper was expensive, uh, so I'd heard that um, Paul's letters were meant to be heard. Um, so the Ephesians that were listening to this would have heard two hundred word sentence, and so how did they comprehend all this? How did that get taught? Was that an all-day thing? I'm, I'm just curious you know, about that's that. a that's an awesome question. I, I love that question. Partly, it has to do with the cultural difference. So there's a lot of research done on oral cultures and, and the ability of people who are in those cultures to actually hear and remember way more than we did. I mean, do you remember when you used to like know a lot of phone numbers? Gosh. I think I could call my wife. I can't even call my office. With that, with, with, so point made. That's one thing. But the other, and this is very interesting about Ephesians. So if you look in your Bible, you'll, you'll notice when it says to the saints in, in Ephesus, and there's like a footnote, and the footnote says a lot of ancient manuscripts don't have in Ephesus in it. You're like, what? This is, how can the letter to the Ephesians not have that? Uh, the best theory and the one that I support in the commentary is that actually this letter was originally written by Paul as to be a kind of a circular letter. So it was to go not just to one church, but to several churches. And if you will, it was kind of a blank. So normally he would say to the saints, you know, in Corinth, and this was to the saints blank. And it seems very likely that what several of the churches did was then to basically, the letter comes and they made their own copy. And some of those copies, i.e. the ones in Ephesus, had to the saints in Ephesus in their copy which then explains why we have some manuscripts that don't have in Ephesus and some that have in Ephesus. But the answer then to the question is, by copying that, they would have been able to read it many times. Uh, so, but would they have gotten into the detail that we're able to get into if we study it? And, and uh, you're not at that detail. But it's likely that this would have been read a numerous times in the communities by people who were much better at remembering than, uh, than I am. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. Uh, let, me, let me ask about the unity message. Um, it, I don't like to look at the news because everything seems so not united. Mm. So does that reflect that we're not, as a church, we're not getting the message out or is it Jesus is keeping a cloud over the world, or what? Well, yes, so if you're talking about the, so what do you say about that? I mean, the divisions within our world and, and certainly within our country and culture are, are striking and painful. And it, can, it, it really, it sometimes feels these days like we're splintering more. Right than than ever before. I I don't know if that's true historically, but that's how it feels. Okay. And then you look at churches, and many of us aren't doing much better. Okay. So I'm PCA, PCS, PCUSA as you folk are, and you know I wouldn't exactly hold us up as the banner of unity, right? <laughs> and I understand the challenges, and we live in that, and I don't need to belabor it, but except to acknowledge the problem. So your question is, so, you know, is Jesus withholding blessing? Maybe. I think a lot of it is that we ourselves get um, is so enculturated, we so drink in the values of the culture around us that the values of the gospel become secondary to us. I mean, real unity in real churches sounds great but it's really hard because you got to put up with people and they got to put up with you and there's lots of stuff we um, we differ on oh I know the spiritual gift I was going to tell you so I was actually speaking no this is what I mean is there are times God gives us something special so I was speaking for a church I didn't know a lot of the detail of what was going on in the church and in the middle of my talk, an illustration came to mind. I was talking about, actually, it was sort of like this, the things we differ on that really don't matter, but they can divide us all up. 
And so I gave an example. I said, you know, when I was younger in the church, I remember the time we changed the carpet. And I mean, there was fighting and there was anger and there was horrible stuff all over just this change of the carpet and people completely forgot who we are in Christ. And now that carpet's still in the building, nobody cares about it anymore, but it was horrible and it was awful and that's not the gospel. And everybody's looking at me like with big eyes. <laughs> and what I didn't know is they were right on the verge of changing the carpet. <laughs> And, I'm, and seriously, I mean, either you say, oh, you just had extraordinary good luck. No, I think God literally gave me that thing to say that was unplanned, although it can come in the planning, so that I could help that church. And it did help them, because it would have been really hard after that for people to still be in their petty little, I don't like this color, I don't like that color. But you know how that is, you know? Music stuff, we just, we, we splinter over things. now. There may be times when there are, are things we need to stand for, and there are times when you might say uh, the, the division has already happened to us. It's not something we've done. So I'm not saying you just put up with every kind of immorality, every kind of heresy. There, there are times when, unfortunately, we, we can't be together. But mostly we do that but it, it's it's so countercultural. look at this verse again live out your calling with humility well how much humility do you see on tv these days i don't care what side you're on right like zero um gentleness huh <laughs> patience huh bearing with one another in love huh making every effort to maintain the unity huh so if we're going to be people who actually experience this, it's going to be a profoundly counterculture. It's going to feel weird. And, and if you really live it out, uh, it sounds great, humility and gentleness and patience, until you're having to do that. And it's not, I, I, I don't generally, when I'm having to be patient with somebody, I'm not thinking, oh, this is just so great. And I'm sure the people that have to be patient with me don't think, oh, this is so great. Right? So it sounds, oh, this is so great. This is really hard. I, I remember um, I was leading a, a, a leadership team in the church some years ago. And we were, having, um, we were having a real conflict. It was really hard and awful. And one of the members said, well, I thought we were supposed to be like a family. <laughs> My response was, yeah, what kind of family do you have? Like, I mean, my experience is family is like the toughest place, and that is part of the real. Like, we're the family of God, and now we got sisters and brothers, and so we actually have to, like, be with the people we don't like. Henry Nowen once said that. He said, you know, the thing about church is you get to be in, in worship sitting next to somebody who would be the last person you really want to sit by. I think, well, yeah. But that's real countercultural. And in a culture that encourages us to split up further and further and further. You know, we thought that the internet was going to create this global awareness, but as it's turned out, most of the research shows it's the opposite. So if you, you have a Facebook account, what'll happen is it'll narrow you so you're only seeing the news that like fits you. And you're not actually engaging with the broader world and broader ideas. Our, our, we're narrowing down to the, you know, the people like us. And so we become more and more divided. And if we're going to be Christians together, we got to work hard. I was really pumped. So Jimmy was down in New York last night with a mission trip with, what's the name of your group here? Darren United. United. And he was talking about the different people who are together in that mission trip. Ah, you know, praise God for that. That is so great because that's more like the gospel, because it's diverse. I'm sure they're diverse. I'm sure there are theological issues between churches or stuff. You, but you're, you're getting together in Christ to serve, and, and you know, I, I just think that's wonderful. And then you drove back this morning. Yeah, another question. We got a little more time. Yes. for his call. Um, 
such as um, at, at a mid, mid uh, career, it's a family uh, situation that I have. Uh, a, a child who has was raised in the church and she no longer believes, but she's you know in mid career she's made a, a fantastic decision to change her life because she wants to help people and she's doing you know at school she's doing well mm. and she's I just see her blossom mm. and I believe God is working through her. Of course I pray for her. Mm -hmm. Now how does that fit in with the Ephesians? Because she's not, she's not working through the call of God. She's working through something in herself. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some great biblical answers to that. So God has the capacity to use. Does that mean we're getting near the end? Can you, uh, can you summarize the question? Oh yes. Uh, the question was, can God's call be active in someone who is is not necessarily recognizing God or a believer? Can God be? actually guiding and directing such a person. And I mean, the biblical answer is that God in his sovereignty can use all kinds of people that way and be at work in them. So you have examples like, well, Balaam's ass would be an interesting one. Uh, uh, Cyrus, you know, the, 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 um, the Persian emperor was used by God, was referred to as God's Messiah, actually. Uh, was not a Christian, but was used by God for God's purposes. Um, and there would be other examples. So absolutely God can move in the hearts of people and use people who are not believers. And in God's sovereignty, that can also lead to their being drawn to him. And obviously that's what you pray for and acknowledge him. Uh, so. Yeah, thanks be to God, he, he does that. Yeah. yeah. Last question, back. One more. Hi, uh, th thank you for coming out. Um, you were talking earlier about some of the challenges of writing the commentary and that um, unlike giving um, a sermon, you can't skip over certain parts. Right. What was one of the most difficult verses you came across and what did you conclude about it? Well, I, I, the. The one actually I referred to was probably the one verse, and then there's one passage. I, um, the verse is in the end of chapter one where it talks about God or Christ being the one filling all things with himself. I don't even remember the exact translation. You can see it's right at the end of, and it's like, what the heck is that? And um, I tried to find other language. I think we would talk more about God's presence in all things in, in our language today. You can look at the commentary, but I, I think that somewhat got it. Honestly, though, the, the passage that terrorized me from the beginning was the marriage passage in Ephesians 5 about submission and headship, partly because that's such a divisive text and partly because I know what I want that text to say. <laughs> But I also know that for me anyway, anytime I, I come before the scripture, but especially in something that's going to be written down and you know, I, I, I want to be open to the possibility that what I once thought was wrong. And so I was terrorized by the complexity of it, the divisiveness of it, and the potential that I might have to change my mind uh, in ways that would be very uncomfortable to my life. So. I literally for f pretty much five years dreaded that. Now you're going to say, well, what did you come up with? Yeah. You have to come back tonight. I'll talk a little bit about it. <laughs> that was well, a good. Uh, well, yeah. Can I ask you one quick follow up there? You just mentioned uh, Balaam and his donkey, and that's one thing that always mystified me. When the donkey was speaking, was it what the donkey thought and wanted to say, or, or was it words that God <laughs> gave, and it wasn't really the donkey speaking, or? You didn't have to do the commentary for that book. <laughs> no, I think, thanks be to God, I didn't have that one. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Hey guys, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, if you got the, uh, the cards, the, the reference cards, uh, you can fill those out, put them on the way out. If you need a pen, we've got some pens up here to, to grab there. And any additional uh, comments you'd like to share are very helpful to us. But thank you, Mark. All right, thank you.